Mark, thank you so much for your time. It's, it's wonderful to meet you. Uh, for the audience, could you please briefly introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Mark, Mark Fournier. I am both a uh, professor at uh, ESCP Europe, one of the leading uh, French business schools, and a co-founder of a venture capital fund called uh, Serena Capital. And I've been working in entrepreneurship pretty much my whole life. That's, that's fantastic. So basically, according to you, what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Can, and, and maybe you can elaborate on your background to, uh, uh, to build your definition. <laughs> but I think a, a true entrepreneur is, 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 is really a calling. It's almost a religious calling. Uh, it's not something that you choose to do, like certain jobs. I think, um, you know, some people become doctors because they have a calling or nurses because they have a calling. It's kind of an urge to want to change things, to want to do things, to want to be the, the, the pioneer and innovate in a number of uh, areas. And, and that's basically what I've done my entire life. I mean, I started um, entrepreneurship when I was 14. My first company was, you know, picking up chestnuts and, and selling them door to door or, or, or fixing up uh, objects that I found in, in rubbish bins. I was already recycling at the time. I didn't know I was doing it, but, <laughs> but that, that was my first entrepreneurial uh, project. And, and I think a lot of it had to do really with the calling and the urge of being of being your own, your own, writing up your own destiny. Thank I you. I that helps. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. But so now, according to you, what are the most important elements to succeed as an entrepreneur? Because obviously, uh, I mean, you face a lot of obstacles all the time. You need to have a vision, uh, you need to, to be able to, to always go forward, to understand your why. So what are some, um, yeah, what are the key elements and, and what are some advices that you have for Um, aspiring entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think there are a number of things. I, I think the, the, the first one is the uh, ability to observe and to listen. And understanding the problem is really the, the key to, to starting any business. Mm -hmm. And and then your your ability to, to, um, uh, to be passionate about what you do. I think it's very hard uh, to, to be an entrepreneur and Put everything you have into a company without being passionate. So on the one side, ability to observe and to listen, and on the other side, um, ability to have you know huge amounts of passion and knowledge on a specific subject. And when you start mixing those two, then you're starting to get that magic sauce. And, and, and a, there's a saying that I really like, it's a thousand mile journey starts with one step. And, and a lot of people dream and a, and a few people do. And those who do are the ones who take that first step. And then you take the second step. And before you know it, you're a few thousand steps in the, in the trip and it's fantastic. And that, that whole journey is really about the, the, the experience itself. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. We, this really resonates with me. Uh, so yeah, I, we actually share the, the, the same definition. Now, what about social entrepreneurship? What is your knowledge of social entrepreneurship and what definition would you um, put forward? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think social entrepreneurship is, is also, it's a moving definition. Um, and I'd love to, to listen to this recording in 10 years from now or 20 years from now and just laugh at it um, <laughs> because, because uh, social or environmental uh, awareness that I grew up with has nothing to, want with, to do with the one that you're growing, growing up with. And, yeah. and the one we were talking about five years ago has nothing to do with the one that we're talking about now. So I think it's a moving definition in terms of, of what it is specifically, but what, what it does entail is to be conscious about, you know, people around you, society, making sure that there's a societal co co cohesion and the way people live together, how we work to get, live together as a village, as a country, as a, as a, as a, as a planet. And so there, there's that aspect of it. And obviously there's the um, environmental aspect of it, which is fundamental. And as the planet keeps on going in the direction we're going in now, the, the urgency becomes more and more craving and we need to act a lot more than we have done in the past. So the definition itself is getting wider and wider and more important. Yeah, no, I, I also agree with that. Um, now, Thanks. I, th I, think that, I think that a lot of people associate social and environmental impact to, to philanthropy. 
But from my perspective, and after discussing with, with some, some change makers all around the world, I believe that the third pillar of sustainability, which is the, the financial pillar, is super important. And, and we often forget to, to mention it. So yeah. my question to you is, what is the potential of social entrepreneurship to tackle some of the most uh, pressing global issues? Because with social entrepreneurship, you can actually make it sustainable. You can have a product or a service that lasts in time and, 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 and that is uh, sustaining itself. So now what is your perspective on that? And uh, yeah, maybe you have a few examples that you can share as well. So, so I, 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 I'm a, I, I don't believe in philanthropy. Um, it, it's something that, that doesn't really solve problems. It, it kind of patches problems on a short period of time and, that, and it doesn't really tackle the, the, the real sources of problems, it, it adds little band-aids and little patches. So it's fantastic. It makes you feel good when you're, you know, in Paris or New York or some, you know, rich country and you're helping some other country or some village somewhere, um, you know, dig a, dig a well for water. Fantastic. But it doesn't really solve the problem. I, I believe that anytime we want to solve things in a, in a, in a long lasting manner, we need um, to have the finances that go with it, and it has to be self-sustainable financially. It doesn't mean it has to be a lot of money. It just needs to be self-sustainable. Um, I've been lucky in my, in my career. I've started dozens of businesses, and one of the most fascinating businesses that I have um, had the chance to start is a, a company called Nelixia. And the Nedixia is a company based out of uh, Guatemala. Um, and we have different factories and, and uh, implantations all over South America. And I've been able to work with communities. So this is a company that we started 15 years ago with purpose to provide natural oils to the perfume industry, essentially. And in order to do so, 15 years ago, we established two rules. One, it would have a positive impact on the environment. And two, it would have a positive impact in the communities we worked with. So it wasn't about building a well or, or, or giving money back to how much money we made. It was about making sure that the communities we worked with were actually getting better by the day not just financially, but in, to, in their perception of what poverty is. And, and poverty is, is about money, but mm -hmm. it's not just about money. It's also about the perception and the dynamic in which you've set yourself into. And there are a number of tools out there that we've used and implemented on the fields. And it's absolutely fantastic. And entire communities have actually changed mentalities and have got, gotten into a positive spiral in terms of bettering themselves, in, in terms of education, in terms of, of pretty much anything that you can imagine. So it's, it's been, it's been a, an incredible journey and I'm very, very proud of being part of that. We have, you know, we've learned a lot, especially in, 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 uh, in Paraguay, uh, where we spent a lot of time, where we have a factory there as well. Uh, there are some people there that work directly with the United Nations and have implemented, um, um, programs such as stoplight and a few others anyway fantastic program sorry to be a little bit long i know no you no it's it's very answers, interesting no it's very, very interesting <laughs> yeah i can see that and and i love that i love that passion so so thank you so much for for sharing um now my, my next question was about the differences that exist between yeah social entrepreneurs so a purpose-driven company that also seeks to be profitable of course and what i would say or call a traditional um, startup, you know, driven by, by profits of, of course, solving one problem, uh, but not necessarily purpose driven. What are the major differences between these two? And do you think that we can, you know, accelerate the shift towards more uh, social entrepreneurs versus um, only um, profit driven companies? Yeah. Um... I, I think that more and more of the two are going to converge. I think that the opposition or the difference between the two we there existed maybe, in, you know, until recently, um, kind of a divergence between the two. I think both are converging. I think profit being profitable today is taking 
into account all the elements of the equation. And I think we believed we were profitable uh, until recently, but it, we weren't really because we were leaving entire elements of the equation out of the equation, such as the environmental impact, such as the social impact that we had on people around the world. So we weren't taking all of that into account. Now, everything now, hopefully we're heading in that direction where yes, it's good to be profitable, but every single piece of the equation needs to be set on the table. I, I, I happen to be on the board of a very large company and it turns out that you know a lot of the profits were made and were not accounted for in, the, um, in that equation. And as we move forward, as we push, as governments and the politics push in the direction of counting everything, I think we'll have a convergence between those two. And any company at this point will have to be, um, uh, um, have an impact, will be an impact company, a purpose-driven company. That's, that's that very, sense? no, that makes a lot of sense. And to, again, accelerate that, that, that transition, who are the biggest players and influencers, according to you, of uh, the government, the corporate world, uh, schools, the education systems? Um, who carries the biggest responsibility and how can we foster more collaboration between yeah. uh, these different um, uh, players, if I may say? Yeah, I think that you get two major um, parties that have impacts. The first one are the people. I think all of us individually have to hold the responsibility as to, you know, what am I buying? Where is it coming from? You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the CEO of this company is, is, is gone pol political. Can I ignore that he or she has pushed a number of things? I think, you know, if they want to become political, then there needs to be consequences to a number of things. So I think as individuals, as consumers, we hold a big responsibility of, you know, if we buy, that means where we agree on something. Purchasing something is a is a sign of agreement. So but how, how many people see it this way? How many people see it this way? Because I think that many of my friends see it this way. I see it this way. But maybe a lot of people are like, yeah, it's just the cheapest option. I'm going to go for that. I mean, people who have money, yeah, they can talk, but I don't have a lot of money. So why should I pay more? to be you know, um, uh, mindful of people and the planet Correct. while I don't have any money. So I think this is a big point. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have traveled the world many times and, and, and gone around. And I only realized recently how heavy my carbon footprint was on the planet. And I've decided to go from many, many trips per year down to two trips. So I've personally taken that action of saying I will only take two airplanes per year. And that's that's one of my big contributions. I'm not saying that we all need to follow the same footsteps. I, it's hard for me to tell a 20 year old kid, you're not gonna visit the world. You're gonna stay at home because I've traveled too much uh, in my earlier days. That doesn't make any sense. It's hard for me to say that, you know, for someone like you who says, I don't have much money and I'm gonna take the cheap uh, version because it may hurt the environment, but at least I can wear something decent. Uh, so all those things need to be taken into account, but what needs to be done as soon as possible is everybody needs to understand there's no reason poor, rich, educated, uneducated, regardless, has to have in mind that the planet is not going to be sustainable the way we're going today with the number of people we have on the planet. So everybody needs to be made aware and at his or her level need to be able to act. And there's actions that can be done, taken by absolutely everyone. Some people will have more or less of an impact because they're polluting more, because they have more money, whatever it is, we all need to head in the same direction. And that's, so people are the number one and then politics is the number two. The politicians have hold a big responsibility. Obviously corporations, but corporations will probably are usually on the cutting edge of innovation, but in this time, uh, this time round, when it comes to adding more costs that don't have a direct return on investments, corporations are going to lag, and the politics need to step up and and actually 
play their role and take uh, you know take full possession of what they're elected for. Absolutely, absolutely. I and again, I I agree with with those points. I think that um, companies also have a huge role to play if they want to lead by example. I think it's good to not have companies waiting to have a market, but to actually create a market when it's when it's not there. Uh, but I totally I totally agree with you on. On, on that the, the the role of the government is, is huge and the uh, responsibility of people it's a it's a it's a great one uh, now going back to your position as academic director of the masters in innovation and entrepreneurship yeah. at OSCP how would you define the um, enthusiasm of uh, your students towards entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and according to you how many of them are familiar with the concept of social entrepreneurship and could be potentially mm -hmm. Um, you know, going towards that direction? Yeah, uh, interesting question. I think there, there's an awareness of wanting to do better uh, as, a, as a general, but the, the, there's a, I find that my students, you know, they're in the range of 23 to 30 years old. A lot of them don't have, have never really measured. The first thing I have them do when they come to the class on the first day of class is I have them measure their carbon footprint. And last year, this past uh, you know, class I had, only one student out of 34 had actually already measured his footprint. And all the others had no clue as to what their footprint was. So it's, it, there's this notion of we want to do something, but we haven't quantified it. So it goes back to my previous purpose, which is we need to make sure that everyone's aware, regardless of to where they live and what their, their financial situation is, they need to be made aware. So one of my jobs as, as a uh, uh, dean of the program is to make sure that we have a number of classes that are geared towards social entrepreneurship. And, and, and whether they become just social entrepreneurs is one thing, but what I want is for all of them to have that notion of fully filling up the equation of how much a product really costs. Does it cost one dollar because you've you've had children work or you've had, you know, you've discarded the environment? No, you have to add all of those costs to it, and it's not one dollar; it's two dollars or whatever the price is, and and that's something that we do. And we have out of the year, it's a um, uh, six month program out of the six months, we have two weeks that are fully dedicated to the environment and to social entrepreneurship so that all of those notions are made of where and the students can actually work around with them. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing again. Um, now, according to you, what, what are the biggest um, global issues in the world? Like what are some global issues that we really need to tackle? Of course, there's many, but what are the most important ones according to you? Gosh. <laughs> I know it's a tough one. It's a tough one. <laughs> That's a massive question. Uh, I think they're, they're, they're two, um, you know, I think, unfortunately, we're, we're in, a, in a situation today where there's urgencies. It's not just let's tackle them in time. They're, they're urgencies. I think we, unfortunately, we have a, a food urgency um, uh, with a new geo political situation that's going to hit the planet in a very short time. Um, and, and I don't know where that's going to lead to, but we need to address the food issue. And then we have to address the environmental issue. So if there are two that I would put on the top of my list until very recently in the, um, the, the Ukraine situation, I'm not sure that I had the food one on the top of my list. But that's definitely something that's going to start getting very, very tense uh, and is probably going to be more problematic in the very, very short term, whereas the environmental is, going to, is very problematic, but in a, a term that might be a little bit longer. So th those would be the, my top two. Uh, and then there are a number of others, unfortunately, but yeah. we, I, I remain extremely optimistic. Mm -hmm. No, it's good. It's, I think it's important to be optimistic, not to be not to be naive, but to, to always try um, yeah, try to do better to assess and to, you know, just always, always go forward because because uh, that's that's the only thing that we we have to do and that that we can do um, on the food sites. I, I think it's interesting um, because you mentioned production and, and I agree with you, but I also think that um, we completely need to rethink the way 
not only we produce food, but we consume food because um, at all uh, stages of the, the food chain, um, there is massive losses. So production, distribution, consumption, our relationship with food is completely broken uh, from my perspective. And um, I think that we, we need to uh, operate system changes and not just assess a few things. I, I think that when, when we think about a relationship with food, like we don't value it as, as much as we, we should, uh, again, from, from my perspective. And, and uh, this is a really, really, really uh, strong point. Um, so again, I, I, I agree with you. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. I think uh, I asked all my questions. Uh, is, there any, is there any last comment, thought, advice that, you, that you'd like to leave for the audience? No, I, I think the, uh, I, you know, we talked a lot of, of issues that are, um, create a lot of anxiety. Um, I think there are a lot of solutions out there. Um, you know, I, I've seen the world for many, many years now, in the light of an entrepreneur, and I, I see solutions, not problems. Um, or at least for each problem, there's a solution. And, and I, I'm, I'm really counting in on this type of uh, talk and this type of um, video and exchange to, to make sure that the next generations, uh, plural, actually find solutions. There's, there's lots of solutions out there. We need to, to fix things. Uh, I, 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 we will find it. You will, we will collectively find a way out of this. Uh, but right now there is an urgency and we need to address it and address it fast, but we'll find a solution. So love what you're doing. And I, I love the messages you're sending across. Thank you so much. John. Thank you. Thank you. And love your enthusiasm because it's, it's very, uh, it's very easy to be, um, you know, to just look at the downsides, but I agree with you. I think we live in a world of opportunities with a lot of bright minds that want to, to have an impact. They don't necessarily know where to go, how to do it. But again, with all the tools that we have now, um, there's so much we can do. And, and obviously uh, the impact can be exponential. So uh, so so yeah, I, I hope that this talk has inspired um, a lot of people or will inspire a lot of people. Um, but yeah, from, from my side, it was a, a really, really pleasant time. So again, thank you for, for, for all your insights. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to meet in person one day. Yeah, Sean, thank you for having me on. Cheers. Fantastic. Bye-bye.